we have been working hard on a project um, within the football data world. So uh, there's a lot of football fans in Graphex. Um, when I first sort of told the idea to the team, it was one of the projects that we've been looking at that definitely had the most sort of emotional reaction from everybody. Uh, everybody has their, their own teams, their own players that they follow. And football statistics are becoming more and more part of the football world. Um, teams have club analysts, uh, scouting methods are really informed by data these days. Um, I think notoriously football has been quite a conservative world in the past. The people have been reluctant to kind of trust numbers. They trust their guts. But um, as, um, as this has become the case in other sports throughout the last sort of decade, uh, we've definitely seen a bit of a data revolution in football. And that's something that uh, as sort of data scientists, engineers and, and journalists, uh, we are really, really passionate about and interested in. So um, we decided to, to have a look at building a dream team um, using the FIFA data set. So there's a lot of FIFA data sets on Kaggle. Um, these provide the names of all of the one 14,620 players uh, that are listed in the most recent release of the game. And this is the data set, right? Exactly. This is the exact one that we used. So they're really publicly available. Um, it seems to be quite a lot of projects that have been, been done using FIFA data sets in the past. Um, and what we get in the data set is obviously the names of the players, the teams, uh, uh, variables about their their physical um, makeup, so how tall they are, how, how much they weigh. And in this data set in particular was really, really um, appealing to us because it has um, at least 35 skill characteristics. So shooting, stamina, speed, agility, crossing ability, these are all uh, listed as quantitative variables. So players are given a score out of 100 uh, for how good they are with regard to this skill. The now, truth is that we, we are not very sure like how reliable this data is. Should be reliable because this is what makes these players to look natural when they are on the game, right? Yeah. Uh, I think the difficulty comes because football data, sports data is so um, private. It's, it's very much a private world. We have companies like Scout, companies like Opta, Statsbomb that, uh, that keep sports data and they sell it to clubs. They sell it to uh, media outlets and, they, and it costs so much money to actually buy this kind of thing. So I to, yeah, I have to say that this guy actually this morning he told us a football manager has a database that could be useful as well. We haven't explored mm -hmm. this yet, but uh, maybe it's even more interesting than the FIFA data set that we use. I didn't know that. Yeah, that's that's really cool. Hmm. So, so yeah, this method also, this concept of Moneyball, where this concept is coming from, Andy. This is uh, quite famous nowadays. It turns out um, that Michael Lewis's book is called Moneyball. It's a study of um, Billy Bean. It's the story of how he took the Oakland A's to uh, uh, great success um, with a team of undervalued players, uh, really. And uh, in Victoriano, we were just talking about how it's become a national bestseller. You know, this is something which uh, has spread across America, across the world, and it's infiltrated not just baseball teams, but all kinds of sports teams. Now, this ideology that Lewis talks about in the book and that Billy Bean himself sort of adopted with statisticians as part of the Oakland A's. And the idea here is to apply data science to scouting. Uh, and we don't just mean sort of descriptive statistics that tell us how many, um, how many runs or, or in, in the world of football, how many goals, how many assists players got. We're talking about the the undervalued statistics, so things like, um, yeah, the, the stamina of a player or, or what are the most important characteristics when factoring in the quality of a player. And the idea that Billy Bean sort of moved forward with was to find these characteristics and to isolate uh, or recognize players that had these characteristics, but for some reason had been undervalued. Then maybe they weren't a big name brand or, or they didn't, um, they didn't have the aura about them, but necessarily they did still possess these key characteristics. And I think this concept is very powerful because uh, it can be applied to, to sports, but can be applied to many other things in life, right? Where you have 
a lot of characteristics that for humans, because we're biased, we never normally overlook or we don't, you know, we don't attribute it the importance that they might have for the things that we want to predict. That in this case is that these players are good. Um, but in other cases it might be that an employee is actually gonna, you know, like stay in the company or be productive or, you know, a customer will buy things or not. So that the very nice thing about this concept of Moneyball and this analysis is that the same very analysis, the same procedure, the same framework can be applied to so many different domains. Exactly, exactly. It's really, it boils down to the process of uh, linking players that have similar abilities, you know, and that, and that could be linking employees that have similar abilities or, or linking customers that have similar preferences or, or, or products that have similar um, tastes, for example, you know, it's the same sort of principle. And we're looking for, um, in this case, the, the key players. So uh, let's talk a little bit more about it, specifically about the project. Yeah. So we decided to have a budget of 100 million euros. Um, that's because as a reference, you know, like it just might be is value um, around that number. Um, mm. For people like Liverpool that they won the, the championship last year, like the total cost of all their players is around 600 million, right? So with just this budget, we were like, can we build like a winning team? Uh, um, yep, yeah, let's let's talk about it. <laughs> exactly. I think the budget is uh, is a really important part of the analysis. It gave us a starting point. Uh, I mean, there, there's there's fourteen thousand six hundred and twenty players in the data set. The, the the value of these players varies massively from sort of uh, under a million to uh, as as you've said, Mbappe, who's at one hundred five million. I mean, um, for modern football clubs, for, for many um, really elite clubs, I'm talking the likes of Sevilla, uh, West Ham United, Aston Villa, the, these clubs are looking to challenge uh, the, the Real Madrid or the Barcelonas or Chelsea, Man United, Man City, but they don't have the resources, they don't have the finance that these clubs do. So um, the 100 million was sort of priced around the mark. Uh, we, we noticed that Sevilla, Sevilla's team cost around 200 million, just twice as high as our budget. Now, mm -hmm. Sevilla already have a very data-driven approach mm -hmm. in their scouting uh, process. They have Monty, a Monchi. Exactly. Super thing. So that they already kind of adopt a money ball approach in, uh, in the way that they recruit players. And we thought, right, so if we can half uh, their their team's worth and still build an exceptional team of footballers that could challenge Sevilla, uh, then I think we've done a good job. Hmm. So once we have uh, like the total amount of money that we want to spend, the next thing will be like, how do we know like what defines like a good player? Like what are the characteristics of a good player? Uh, how did we do that? Yeah, so as I mentioned, we, we have the performance attributes of players in the data set. So we listed these as factors when we built a prediction model in GraphX. Um, we chose models as the analysis type um, and then train and predict. Um, as I said, we, we listed all of the uh, skills, their quantitative variables, so marks out of 100 for uh, speed, agility, this kind of thing as factors. And then we try to predict the value of a player based on these factors. So Maybe I can, I can show you a little bit. What, what do you mean by that? When exactly. This is the original data set. We just uploaded from the Kaggle after downloading it as a CSV. And yeah, if you go to models, uh, we have this called train and predict. And you just look for the value. In this case, that is what we yeah. wanted to predict, right? Exactly. Core value. Uh, you see that graphics automatically even detect that this is a currency, this is money. That's the data type. We even detect that type of data type, okay? Value in euros. Uh, and then we will look for these attributes because you see we have 62 variables. So we just focus on these variables that are like, a, I don't know, like a properties of these players about their abilities and skills, right? Yeah, exactly. 
um, like, like this, like crossing, finishing, right? Like a ball control. So we selected this by 32, 35, you said? 35, yeah. 35. Uh, yep. We just did this. this. Um, I mean, people can actually see like what are the default parameters that we use for building these models in case they want to reproduce this with code in Python on R. You can always say, like, what, what do we actually use for the parameters and what type of uh, models we, we did. But you don't have to change this. We calculate this automatically for you, and it will work exactly as we did this analysis, just leaving it as it is. Okay, so you just click Next, uh, Execute, and the prayer will be created. Exactly, exactly. And uh, maybe we can have a quick look at the the graph uh, of all players so our first approach was to um was to look at all players in the data set we thought okay great what can we find um how does the how does graphx how does the model kind of compute these players how does it relate one of them uh, each to each other uh, and what we found was was really interesting there was a very um kind of uh, even split. So I think I'm sharing my screen now. If I go to general position here, um, which uh, is the position of players, so we created four um, quite general uh, positions, midfielders, defenders, forwards, goalkeepers, and our model has uh, separated these quite nicely. You can see based, the model had no idea the positions of players when we built it, it only had a, an idea of uh, what these players can do, so what are their skills? And it was really interesting when we first opened it up that we have quite a clear distinction between the four positions. This red cluster at the top here is goalkeepers, um, and then green is forwards, blue midfielders, and the orange cluster is defenders. And this kind of overlap here uh, represents the difference between uh, right the wing backs so they're more attacking defenders and defensive midfielders so that's why we get a little bit of an overlap between uh, midfielders and defenders but generally they are very um segmented now if we also have a look at the value quartiles so when we built the project using value as a target graphx automatically calculated uh quartiles which is really handy and this became really important uh, in our analysis later on um, and as we can see horizontally this time, there's a really nice segmentation between the different quartiles. So we have low players on the far left, low value players on the far left, medium low, uh, medium high, and then high value players. And this is where we wanted our team to be around the likes of Lewandowski, uh, De Bruyne, Griezmann, uh, Neymar, Salah. So we were looking for players that would be uh, around this category, but perhaps not um, not as valued as, as highly. So um, after this, we decided, okay, great, we've got a, a graph, we've got a project that looks at all players, but possibly um, having players in the general positions grouped together like this wasn't the most efficient way kind of pick out the key characteristics of players because as as we know uh, the characteristics of forwards differ massively from the characteristics of defenders or goalkeepers so i guess we wanted to have a look at how did the characteristics of a forward um differ between value quartiles so we created four more prediction models uh one for each sort of general position in the data set, one for forwards, midfielders, defenders, and goalkeepers. And we started to look at what differentiated each value quartile. Am I kind of keeping up to speed here, Victoriano? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I was just trying, I mean, there's a bot on the chat and I was trying to, to block him, so I was a little oh, right. bit <laughs> looking no, no, at that. No. But, but yeah, go ahead. I mean, keep keep going with this. Okay, great. So um, the value quartiles then became really important. What we wanted to do now was understand what differentiated a low value player from a high value player, put simply. So we go to the compare chart and we can open up the value quartiles like this, um, adding in each of the categories. 
and it's just a little bit slow because I'm sharing my screen. But you can see that it starts to bring up. Uh, these are the skills of the players that uh, that differentiate high value players from from low value players, for instance. So when when we generate compare charts and graph X, the order of the charts actually signifies the relevance of the variables. So these ones at the top positioning, finishing, ball control, reactions and shot power are the characteristics that are most relevant to the difference between high value players and low value players. Now, the reason why this was important is because this gives us an ability to, to know what we're looking for when we're looking for these players. We want players that don't cost a lot of money, but have a high positioning rating, a high finishing rating, a high ball control rating, a high reactions rating, and a high shot power rating. And this is for forwards. So we repeated this process for midfielders, for defenders, for goalkeepers. And yeah. So, um, okay, so you're showing now like those are for in general, no, you are in, in the forwards, right? This exactly, yeah. So we took these characteristics, positioning, finishing, ball control, reaction, shot power, and we knew that these were the key characteristics uh, that we wanted our team to have, but then we don't want them to cost much money. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess the next step in the analysis was to go to go back to the graph and um, I think one thing that is what became quite clear is that older players tend to be valued a lot less. So we, we started filtering these key characteristics, we looked for undervalued players and what we we're finding is that um, <clears throat> players towards the end of their career the likes of uh, Ramos is maybe not as valuable. Even even Messi, you know, he, he's not as valuable. Had it, it would be interesting if you go to the variable of age and just exactly. let's look at the distribution so that we can define what is old and young in terms of a football player looking at this. So you can see like the most frequent values are between 20 and 25. So the, the big majority of players in these major leagues are that age. If you click on the distributions, click on the, on the yeah, uh, you, we see that the median is 24 and the third quartile, so that's the 25% of the players that are older, the oldest ones, it starts at 28 years old. So that, that probably means that if you are 28, you are starting to be like between the oldest, older players in the, in the leagues. Exactly. So, Anything older than 28, 30 years old can be considered as an old player, believe it or not. And 30 years old now, um, this is depressing, very depressing. <laughs> this means that even though I was a very good football player when I was a child, I won't, I, I don't have any chance anymore of becoming never a player in the major leagues. Never say never, Victoriano. Statistically, uh, I believe in data, Andy. Yeah. This is my religion. I believe in this. I believe this more than my desire to become a professional football player. Maybe in another life we uh, <laughs> we can do this. This is why we go for this kind of project, though, because we can't play ourselves. But. That's true. That's true. If we were playing, we were we would be rich and we wouldn't care about anything in life except <laughs> to where to spend the money. Maybe we will use graphics to, you know, do some financial analysis and that sort of things. You know? Exactly, exactly. It wouldn't be a bad idea. I don't think we would have uh, mm -hmm. any worries about that. Mm -hmm. So I think the other thing to remember as well is that the point that you're making about the age um, is exactly right. We, we, we have uh, players older than 28, players that are older than 30, they start to become uh, unwise investments. You know, uh, the, the clubs don't want to spend too much money on players that are likely to end their careers soon. Um, Sorry, and I have an emergency. No problem at all, it happens to the best of us. Yeah. I was just saying that uh, we don't want to spend money on players that are likely to end their careers soon. You know, it's not, it's not necessarily a good investment from a club side. So what we did was filter players under the age of 28. So uh, I can move this. Uh, we kept this filter active 
And we also filtered players uh, by value. So we go to value, repeat the process, have both filters active, and we're looking for players under 10 million euros. So now the graph presents only players that are younger than 28 or, or 28 and are valued less than 10 million euros. Uh, and if I zoom in on this uh, and I apply uh, size mapping and color mapping, just take the size of these nodes down a little bit and bring up some of the labels, then what we have is uh, a graph of all of our candidates. Any player on this graph may possibly be cheap enough and young enough to fit in our team. Now, um, maybe you want to talk a little bit about how we then look for players, Victoriano. Oh, sorry, I think I've lost your microphone there. I can't You're right. You. I was I was in mute. Uh, <laughs> yes. So the next thing is once we have this, this is like a good list of candidates and we more or less know uh, we want to find players that are as close as, as, as we can to the to that area where we will have like the very top players. So if you zoom in, zoom in a little bit. Yeah, we, sure. you might also do you have the article like the blog post open? Because yeah. maybe we can, you know, we already have annotations in that chart, and I think it might be easier to read. Exactly. So if you go to the blog post, all this process is step by step uh, in our blog. And this is exactly the same thing that we were looking into. Um, as you can see, since, you know, that players, they're around the 10 million, we could for sure get others that were cheaper than that. But I mean, since we want to be like as close as we can to the top players, we will go for those in 10 million. I mean, there's can can you zoom in also with the <laughs> with the browser, like yeah. within this blog post? Yeah, <laughs> good, good. So I mean, we we see that there are some other players that are close, that are even half of 10 million. There are five million players that are not that far. So if you have if we have even less money than that. I mean, yeah. we could totally go for these players. I mean, they're not going to be much worse using this data. It is true, and this is what is interesting, <laughs> that some people I, I've seen in the comments on Twitter when we post shared this this morning, they told us that there are some players, I don't think they're here, they're in other type of uh, other positions, but they yeah. will be saying like, hey, but these players, I don't know, they they're you know they're drunk or they you know they like partying a lot or they so there are other barriers of course that for sure yeah. they're important but this these are the things that probably a good scout or a good you know anal analyst analyst will know these variables on top of the variables that we use uh, as a reference so that they can even filter out other players okay but since we don't have some data about these players we will go for those who are closer to the top so like exactly these ones that we created this annotation that you were reading. Exactly. There's so many things that are involved with football transfers that you can't control. You know, like when you have a player moving from uh, Brazil to the UK, for instance, there's no guarantee that even if he is the most promising young player in the world or she, then, uh, then they might not settle into the country. You know, this happens so, so many times. These are big money transfers. There's so much at stake. Um, but it's not a guarantee that a transfer will succeed. But I think the the underlying um, thing that we wanted to investigate with this project is we can control some aspects. You know, we can control that the fact that player is a genuine prospect. Um, there's always going to be uh, unknown uh, variables and and risk involved with with football transfers for sure. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. Uh, so yeah, that's pretty much it. I mean, we will repeat this for each position and that's where we will have this short list of, um, candidates for deciding which ones to get. Uh, exactly. Um, and then after we've built 
what is essentially a shortlist for our candidates for each position it came to building the team itself uh, the exciting part of course we put on our managers track suits uh, put on our thinking caps and really it we were confident that um that many of the players that we've chosen in our shortlist were were able to to meet the criteria that were in our team they were close enough to the top of the graph they were close enough to the elite players in the sport that we knew that they were good uh, but still there was a little bit of noise in the data so what we wanted to do now if we have uh, maybe three candidates for right winger um which i think we did then we want to find which one of those candidates is the uh, is the most skilled in in the key characteristic levels so we looked again at these key characteristics for um maybe i can show you for a goalkeeper for example which is reflexes diving positioning mm -hmm. uh, handling and reactions mm -hmm. and we we matched our prospects our can, can you zoom in a little bit so that, yeah. i mean they can actually see that we are comparing for instance this guy called Casa Nega <laughs> with Oblak that will be right now, according to the data from FIFA, like one of the top players, um, uh, goalkeepers, right? Yeah. With a uh, medium. So you see he's like between the medium and the best, closer to the best than the medium, right? And still with yeah. a relatively low value. Exactly. I think what's important here is that we pay attention to the red uh, the red line uh, exactly. refers to the high um, high value players. So as this this is kind of where that red uh, line is peaking, probably for reflexes around seventy five to seventy eight. Mm -hmm. So for Gazaniga, who is um, sort of an undervalued player, we we've got him. He he's higher than that peak. You know, uh, he's around. The, I think he is actually uh, scored at eighty. The reflexes mm -hmm. um so the methodology here was really get as high as possible on each of these characteristics so we can see the slope again sort of descending he's towards the higher range but while still keeping the value as low as possible and this is pretty much it mm -hmm. yep that's everything that we wanted to tell today um thank you so much for listening to us um we can keep discussing this on any other place. Thank you okay. so much, Andy. Have a good evening. You too. Enjoy yourself. Bye-bye.